Hello! Welcome back to another edition of our archaeogastronomical adventures. My name is Thomas Dinas and this is the Delicious Legacy podcast. Today we're going to talk about ice and ice cream. Ooh, how much we love a good gelato, don't we? Well, okay, okay, I know we are in the middle of the deepest, darker winter. It's early January. It's freezing cold outside. Temperatures plummet. Grey skies. No chance of a reprieve coming soon. Spring is almost certainly at least three months away. The warm rays of the sun won't be felt until April. And I'm talking about ice cream. I know. I'm a bit crazy like that. Well, I do eat ice cream in the middle of winter, though. Who else does? Let me know on Twitter. Um, I do love chocolate ice cream, to be honest, a lot. All year, all year round. Regardless of the, of the weather. <laughs> we consider ourselves um, so clever and lucky. We, when, when I say we, I mean the modern uh, human, the, progress, the progressive and progressed technologically advanced 21st century mankind. We can have ice cream whenever we want, anytime we like. We can have it to please our taste buds, to feel its coolness on a hot summer's afternoon and get that feel, that freezing satisfaction on, our, on the tip of our tongues while sat under an umbrella on a sandy beach. Ah, a cooling balm on a sweltering midday sun. And yet, and yet, there is always a but, eh? Well, I can tell you of a machine. Yeah, it's a machine. It's not an electrical machine, but it's a machine from the 19th century that was quicker, more efficient, more aesthetically pleasing, and entirely carbon neutral to run that made the best gelato you could ever have. In a way, for someone owning this machine in 1885, it was easier to make ice cream then than in most uh, household kitchens now. You could make ice cream in three whole minutes. The transformation to a snowy white cream happened so quickly and is so beautiful. Now, I can, and I do sometimes ice cream at home, by hand, in the freezer for 30 minutes, out to stir it and break up the ice crystals, back in again, repeat the process for 3 hours every 30 minutes, back and forth, back and forth. As good as it is, never tastes quite the same as an expert's artisan's gelato. I can't compare the silky creaminess of a properly churned ice cream to my handmade ice cream. In short, a bit of a disappointment and perhaps uh, brings back home the point that there's always someone that can make it better for you. So yeah, buy it from, from outside. But it doesn't have to be this way, you know. We'll talk about this machine later on on the podcast. First, let's go a bit further into the past. Shall we? Way before our 19th century ice cream maker. It does seem that there's nothing new under the sun. Right? What we, what could call itself the first ice cream cup was found in Egypt in a tomb from the second dynasty, 2700 BC. This was a kind of mold consisting of two silver cups, one of which contained snow or crushed ice and the other cooked fruit. Ice houses, where snow was stored and ice deliberately formed, were undoubtedly an, ex an extremely ancient invention. Around AD 300 in India, they found a way to manufacture cheap ice. Porous clay pots contained boiled, cooled water were laid out on top of straw in shallow trenches. Under favorable circumstances, Thin ice would form on the surface during winter nights, which could be harvested and combined for sale. Of course, ancient Persians by 400 BC have mastered the art and technique of creating ice in the deserts of Iran for all their needs, which would be for storing food and for the pleasure in form of iced drinks. 
This uh, practice requires an ingenious structure called Yakchal. Four centuries later, the Emperor Nero had snow and ice transported from mountains or volcanoes such as Mount Etna, where this natural ice being stored in ice boxes and buried in wells for, to be preserved. Nero also feasted his guests with crushed fruit with honey and snow, practices that Seneca found very expensive. How long uh, have these uh, sorbet and frozen fruits been eaten? Historians remain generally silent on the subject. It seems uh, these icy preparations um, started very early on and lasted uh, a lot longer in the Middle East than in Western Europe. Going further back in time and uh, further east, we go to China in the 16th century BCE. Under the Shang dynasty, we are told that the emperor reveled in these granitas made of snow, milk and spices. Chinese had developed a process where they managed to freeze ice cream by using salt and saltpeter, nitre, to lower the freezing point of ice. King Tang, circa 1675-1646 BCE, had 94 icemen, not actual uh, snowmen made of ice, been alive. That would be very interesting, but not that. Uh, he had 94 icemen, who helped uh, to make a dish of buffalo milk, flour and camphor. During the Tang Dynasty, an elegant drink was recorded which consisted of goat, cow or buffalo milk, cooked with flour and camphor and then placed in iron containers and buried in snow or ice. The legend said that uh, Kublai Khan founder of the Yuan dynasty, loved to drink milk and he would add ice to the milk to make it last longer during the summer. He also added preserves and jam to his favorite icy drinks, creating the first prototype of ice cream, let's say. Kublai Han issued a decree that anybody except the royal family can make ice cream in order to keep the production process private. Of course, uh, in uh, the same legend, the famous uh, Italian traveller of the Middle Ages, Marco Polo, met Kublai Han and had the honour of enjoying this royal treat. And after leaving China, it's said that Marco Polo brought the technique of uh, making ice cream back to Italy. Marco Polo is often recognised for bringing knowledge of Chinese ice cream techniques to Italy where they were perfected. But it seems clear that uh, the news about ice cream have travelled in Europe way before uh, Marco Polo, through the Arab world, uh, and also via n a number of other sources. And, of course, by a continuation of the ancient Romans, and so on. The Arabs uh, called it Chinese snow. The Persians called it Chinese salt. Ancient Greeks and ancient Romans of the upper classes used this white powder dissolved in water to cool their wines. It was an expensive commodity, fairly rare and difficult to find, and its use appears to have been limited only to the cooling of bottles of wine at important dinners. Yes, we are talking about saltpeter or potassium nitrate, which we know that it can be used for gunpowder. But uh, saltpeter cools water by producing an endothermic reaction. This is a chemical reaction whereby it dissolves. As it dissolves, the saltpeter literally pulls the heat out of the water as part of that process, thus lowering the temperature of the water. And for this reason, there is a limit to how cool the water can become. From the Greeks and the Romans, this method was passed on, or perhaps rediscovered and improved, which is the crucial point, by Persians and Arab physicians. Visitors from Europe to the East were struck by the wonderful 
sherbets and chilled syrups. Pierre Bellon was a Frenchman, a traveler, a naturalist and a writer who visited the Middle East in the 16th century. So at the height of the Ottoman Empire. And um, obviously the, the, the sultans of the Ottomans, they were famous for their sweet tooth. Pierre Bellon marveled at the sweet cold drinks. Some are made of figs, others of plums and of pears and peaches. Others again from apricots and grapes, yet others of honey and the sherbet maker mixes snow or ice with them to cool them. In Persia, sherbets were made from lemon, orange or pomegranate juice. First, the fruit is squeezed through a silver strainer. Then sugar was added and water to dilute. Finally, ice was piled in. This technique was later captured in the Persian text Ain Ay Akbari, the Institutes of Akbar, about 1600, by Abul Fazl Alami. Reading this text uh, from its translation, we get saltpeter, which in gunpowder produces the explosive heat, is used by His Majesty Akbar as means for cooling water, and is thus a source of joy for great and small. Saltpeter is a saline earth. They fill it, they fill with it a perforated vessel, and pour some water over it, and collecting what drops through, they boil it, clean it, and let it crystallize. One share of water. Is, is then put into a goglet of pewter or silver or any other such metal and the mouth closed. Then two and a half shares of saltpeter are thrown into the vessel together with five shares of water and in this mixture the goglet is stirred about for a quarter of an hour when the water in the goglet will become cold. The price of saltpeter varies from three quarters to four months per rupee. So we see here how the ancients and the Middle Age and the Arabs in the Middle Ages were making icy cold drinks in the middle of the desert. The first uh, quote, ice cream unquote, on the American continent was the paella, was the paella, a tradition in the pre-Columbian Ecuador. The Caranquis, or Caras, before being conquered by the Incas, sent expeditions to bring blocks of ice and snow down from the top of the volcano in Bambura, wrapped in thick layers of straw and feyon leaves for thermal insulation. The ice cream was then made by filling a large cauldron, called, called a paella, with ice, snow and fruit juice, and sometimes milk and mixing vigorously until the juices and ice froze together. Using this ancestral technique, gradually perfected over centuries, helados de paella are still prepared traditionally today in some places in Ecuador, especially in the modern town of Imbabura, wrapped in thick layers of straw and leaves for thermal insulation. In 1689, the Sicilian Francesco Procopio del Coltelli opened the first café in Paris, Le Procop. He not only served coffee there, but also over a hundred different sorbets and ice creams. All the good Parisian society is rushing into it, including the quality ladies, which was not done until then. And if they dared not to leave the carriage, Vale brings the ice creams to them. In 1720, he invented frozen mousses by adding whipped cream to his ice creams. These Chantilly ice creams immediately became fashionable. In the 18th century, glaciers multiplied in Paris and consumption now spreads throughout the year. Ice creams are served in cups or in bricks, molded in fruit, egg cups or glasses. The French Revolution won't kill the ice cream. On the contrary, it democratizes them. Glacier then becomes a profession in its own right and ice cream makers invaded French homes. By the mid-1700s, 
sweet ices were a common food. Sorbetto sellers walked through Naples in Italy, selling ice cream in all sorts of flavors, including sweet orange, bitter cherry, muscat pear and jasmine. It was made and carried in a sorbetiera, a tall container with a metal lid inside a bucket of ice and salt. The salesman would spin the sorbetiera around inside the bucket every few minutes to keep it creamy as it froze. Every so often, they'd stir the ice cream with a wooden spatula. Sorbetto was the cuts all Italian world for ice cream back then, rather than gelato. In the Regency period here in, in uh, UK, a large wooden tub, preferably of a cylindrical shape, or better still, wider at the top than at the bottom, was the ideal shape of a vessel to be used with cooling with saltpeter. This cooling tub should be lined with sheet, lid or uh, zinc and could also have a closing fitting lid which, which would exclude as much of the warmer ambient air as possible. The thicker the surrounding wood of this box, of this tub, the better the cooling mixture would be insulated. A cooling tub with a capacity of 10 or to 12 gallons should be filled with 4 or 5 gallons of water. The cooler the water, the better, so water just pumped or drawn from a well would be the most effective, since the water temperature would be about um, 75 Fahrenheit, which is uh, about 23 degrees, 24 degrees Celsius. 5 to 7 pounds of saltpeter should be pulverized to the finest powder possible. This finely powdered saltpeter should be slowly sprinkled into the water and allowed to dissolve. Within about 15 minutes, the temperature of the water would drop 25 to 30 degrees, and within half an hour, the temperature would drop another 4 or 5 degrees. At that point, the temperature of the water would remain steady for over two hours, so long as the lid was kept uh, on the tub as much as possible. After that, the water would begin to warm at a rate of about 3 or 4 degrees per hour, unless more powdered saltpeter was uh, added to the water. This process is essentially what happens when someone churning ice cream at home adds rock salt on a, to the bed of ice around the ice cream container. Adding salt to the bed of ice speeds the freezing process up much better than just ice alone. Uh, we are coming slowly to our um, to our ice cream maker of the 19th century. Let's put in t- into our um, equation Agnes Bertha Marshall. She was an English culinary entrepreneur. She was born in Walthamstow in 1855, which was then part of Essex, not uh, as East London as you can get nowadays and she was known as the Queen of Isis, and also a leading cookery writer, which uh, some food historians claiming that she is a class above uh, Mrs. Beaton, and probably they are right, actually, you know. According to, according to the book uh, by B. Wilson, Consider the Fork, Miss Marshall ran a cooking school at 31 Mortimer Street. Not long afterwards, she opened a shop which claimed to equip an entire kitchen with everything that was necessary, from knife cleaners to ice cream molds. She sold essences and food colorings as well, and she wrote cookbooks, two on ice cream and two general, which had advertisements for her own products at the back. Her 1888 cookbook included a recipe for cornets with cream, which may be the first publication of the edible ice cream cone. Mrs. Marshall's uh, patent freezer, an ice cream maker, advertises smooth and delicious ice produced in three minutes. Three minutes, by hand, non-electric. What kind of sorcery is this? Today's top-of-the-range ice cream makers aimed at home cooks boast that they can deliver ice cream or sorbet in less than 30 minutes, and of course at a considerable cost. How on earth uh, Miss Marshall's uh, machine managed that without the aid of electricity? I hear you ask, and I ask too. 
So her machine looks very similar to the classic American hand-cranked ice cream machine invented uh, by Nancy Johnson in 1843. In Johnson's machine, a metal container sits inside a bucket and like with the sorbetiera, you put the mixture in the metal container and ice and salt into the bucket. The lid is put on and the handle is cranked, which turns the dasher inside, scrapping the ice cream from the sides of the metal container as it freezes. This can be done in 20 minutes on a not too warm day, if you put as much ice and salt in as possible. Mrs. Marshall's machine is better because it is so wide and shallow, thus providing a greater surface for the ice salt mixture to come into contact with. The ice and salt is only packed under the container this time, not around the sides. So those two crucial differences in points make it extremely faster and more efficient to make ice cream. Another difference is also that uh, the central paddle stays still and the crank on the top turns the metal container around. In all other domestic ice cream makers, electrical or not, it's always the other way around. So there you go. This machine can make ice cream in three minutes. Uh, however, there was a snag with her machine. She made hers out of zinc to save money and make it more um, viable for mm, all households. But zinc is poisonous metal. Um, I don't think it's going to be a very cr great selling point in today's world, to be honest. But I'm sure I'm sure we can manufacture something similar with a different metal and get equally fast results. She also suggested using a liquid oxygen to make ice cream uh, and a music trick for the scientifically inclined. By the aid of liquid oxygen, each guest at a dinner party may make his or her own ice cream at the table by simply stirring with a spoon the ingredients of ice cream to which a few drops of liquid air have been added by the servant. Excellent um, idea here by, by Mrs. Marshall, which um, Heston Blumenthal replicated by using liquid nitrogen to do the same thing. And I think he said somewhere that he got the inspiration from Mrs. Marshall. When did uh, people start uh, putting ice cream into edible cones? Many historians have pointed to the recipes of uh, Agnes B. Marshall as precursors of the ice cones, as we've seen. Her cookery book of 1887 includes instructions for making cones with cream, as we've seen, uh, cone-shaped vessels made of a sweet paste of blanched almonds and flour, rolled around cone molds, baked and filled with sweetened vanilla-flavored whipped cream. These cornets can also be filled with any ice cream or water ice, Marshall nods, the latter referring to frozen water concoctions like granitas, and served for dinner, luncheon or supper dish. It seems possible that future innovators were inspired by the fancy confectionery like Mrs. Marshall, but it seems more likely that the ice cream cone evolved out of efforts to help street vendors avoid um, breakage and sanitation concerns that came uh, with using dishes and spoons. So in 1901, we have uh, Antonio Valvona, an Italian citizen living in Manchester, England, uh, which he filled a, pat a patent for uh, an apparatus for baking biscuit cups for ice cream. The device was designed for baking dough or paste, composed of the same material as are employed in the manufacture of biscuits. And when baked, the set cups or dishes may be filled with ice cream, which can then be sold by the vendors of ice cream in public thoroughfares or other places. The following year, Valvona teamed up with Frank Marcioni, an Italian immigrant in New York, to found the Valvona Marcioni Company, which produced the patented cups and the ice cream sold in them. Valvona operated the, fir the firm's factory in the UK while Marcioni ran the American operations, first on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and then in Brooklyn as trade grew. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> There's also <laughs> a myth about the making of the ice cream cone as well, which 
I mean, I love I love all these uh, little uh, myth nuggets being created for something um, so I don't know, so common, so innocent, so innocuous as a as an, as an ice cream cone, as an edible ice cream cone, and especially something that is not lost in the mists of time, but it's fairly new, like 120 years ago or something. So, according to the visitors of the world at the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. So according to, to this myth, visitors at the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904 ate plenty of ice cream in cones, or cornucopias, as they were called at the time. From photographs of the time, we can see that uh, the long cones have uh, waffled sides and pointed bottoms, and they appear to resemble the molded type of waffle cone familiar to us today, instead of a just rolled up waffle. This suggests that the confection was neither an improvised creation from a waffle stand, nor a product of Alvona's or uh, Marchioni's biscuit cup mold. So what happened in that uh, World Fair in St. Louis is that uh, the Star Bottling Company snagged the coveted soft drink concession, which gave it uh, exclusive rights to sell flavored sodas, lemonade, root beer, ice creams, ices and all hot and cold drinks usually served at soda fountains. A few weeks later, uh, after the fair was closed in December the 1st, 1904, Star, the Star Company sued, sued the organizers for $257,000 in damages for a range of uh, alleged contract violations. So among the many items in dispute was uh, which food and beverage item uh, Star exclusively, ex- Star's exclusively franchise covered. These records of the court case signaled one in particular. Whether ice cream cornucopias pertained to an ice cream concession or were a food because of the edible wafer wrapping the ice cream and pertained to a restaurant or lunch stand concession. So as we've seen, so curiously, curiously enough, none of these records from the many court cases make any reference um, that the defendants uh, invented the ice cream corn by rolling up a waffle, or by, by just inventing it back then, in 1904, for the, for the fair. So, it was already established thing. Almost all these stories, they started coming up a decade, a decade after the fair. And all, all these tellings involve an element of drama. Typically, an ice cream vendor runs out of cups, or guests uh, start ruining their clothes as they eat melting ice cream with spoons, and some crafty person saves the day with a rolled up waffle. So this obviously is not true. It's, it's a part of the myth making of the of the ice cream cones. And uh, other 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 um, myths and myths regarding this is that um, a supposed inventor was. Um, Ernest Hamoui, a Syrian-born concessionaire selling Zalabia, a sort of thin Middle Eastern waffle. So yeah, that's another supposed inventor of, of the of the ice cream cone. Anyway, and the rest, as they say, is history. This was a passage from uh, the from a from an article from the Sprout Sheets, talking about the the ice cream cone. Um. All in all, we have to agree that there is very little to teach our ancestors with regards to ice cream making, and especially ice cream making at home. And that is it. Our little story about um, artificial ice, cooling drinks and ice creams throughout um, human history. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can find more information, photos, links, and sources in my Patreon page, which is, if you go to Patreon, the Delicious Legacy Podcast. And if you want, you can support the podcast uh, monthly with as little as $3 per month. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Once again, my name is Thomas Dinas. Thank you very much. Goodbye.